Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. And happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and the spiritual mothers. Because Mother's Day is a beautiful day for some people, and it's not a beautiful day for some people. But there are many people that I know that have no children that have invested year after year after year into children. And some of us are the result of those people investing in us. So why don't you stand with me this morning? And we are going to begin by worshiping the Lord and just declaring the great things that he's done and looking to his goodness this morning. So who's with me? Amen. Amen. Okay. Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, we worship you this morning, Lord. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it. Your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Let's lift our voice and declare that this morning. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all, Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah. 
open our hearts to all that you have today. And we give everything to you this morning. All of our love and our adoration. All the glory and the praise.
there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and i will build my life upon your love Yeah. 
worship you in this place. Lord, there's really no other word than you just bring heaven to us. And Lord, we're so grateful to be able to stand in your presence, to stand in the midst of our Holy Father, knowing, Lord, that you are here and you are, you are among us because you just desire a relationship. You desire intimacy with your children. And Lord, we know that you do great things. We know that you do the impossible. We know that you are the provider. We know you are the encourager and the sustainer and the redeemer and the restorer and the life giver and the breath giver and the list goes on and on and on. And this morning we are so humbled to be on the receiving end of your overwhelming love. When we come to pour our worship on you, you just pour it all right back. Lord, may we be people of your presence. May we be people that have ears to hear and eyes to see who you are and, and where you're leading us and what you're asking of us. May we be people who are surrendered to say, Lord, you build my life. You take my plans and you take my purposes. I will follow your way. And so, Lord, thank you for these sweet, sweet moments in your presence. May every moment that we walk out through the rest of this day and this week, Lord, be filled with a reminder of these moments in your presence. May we seek out more moments like this in our own homes, in our own cars, in our own workplaces. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work that you're doing in us today. In your name, amen. What a sweet time of worship, amen. Why don't you take a minute and greet one another, and then we'll continue on with our service. For the moms who raised us up gave us hope and made us strong. For the young moms who became moms sooner than expected and gave it all they had. For the single moms who had to figure out how to do this on their own. For those who never got called mom, but who cared for us all like a mom would. For the hurting moms who've loved and lost but never given up. For the praying moms who don't always know what to do but always know who to talk to. For the working moms, the stay-home moms, the cooking moms, and the takeout moms. For taking care of us when you barely had enough time to take care of yourself. For teaching us how to walk and how to make a difference. For the late night snuggles and the early morning pancakes. For sitting with us after our first breakup. For lifting us up when others put us down. For the rides, the meals, the laundry, and the birthday parties. For the years, tears, laughter, and love. It's not enough, but we want to say thank you. Thank you for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. We love you. We honor you. We remember you. We thank you. I hope so, because it's true. It's true, Holly. Moms are the best. When we, when we were looking through videos, we said no to a whole bunch of them. And that one in our staff meeting had 
even me crying. So <laughs> I said, okay, I'm, I am, my eyes are filled with tears. I think you've got the winner. <laughs> so happy Mother's Day, moms and all of our ladies here today. Um, we live in a world that is devaluing motherhood and, um, and what, what the gender of women bring to the table. And then with the gender of men separately. But what the, the, the uniqueness of how God made you. And on this Mother's Day, we want to say, we celebrate who you are as moms and as women. We celebrate that today. And I say this, and this isn't something new, but I think it needs to be said more and more and more um, in kind of our society that's getting warped, um, is that I think the most important job on the planet is being a mom. I really do. You know, dads were important too. We got to be there just as much. But, but um, moms, you, I always say this about Suzanne. I know our homes are different, but, you know, Suzanne's the heart of our home. She's the heart of our family. And a lot of you moms and women are the same way. And um, so be proud of, of who God made you to be, that you're a mom, you're a woman, and we're proud of you. And so um, when you leave today, moms, um, there will be some kids greeting you out of the door, outside the doors, handing you a, a gift just to say that you are loved. And so hope it's just one more little way that we as a church can, um, can stand with the day that our country stands and says, moms, you're awesome. So hey, if you're by a mom there, give her a hug. If you're by your mom, if you're by your wife, give her a kiss. Do that, say, Hap, tell them how awesome they are, Suzanne. I said it to her already, you're the best mom on the whole planet. For our family. For our family. Well, happy Mother's Day. Kids, the reason you're in here today for the whole service is because we love moms. And moms are going, really? Um, we wanted, we thought, how do we tear children away from their moms on Mother's Day? And so uh, the kids, except the little, our littles, are, uh, are with us today. We have a family service a couple times a year, and we do it on Mother's Day as one of the days, just to keep our kids by their mom. Because cause if you're here with your mother today and you're a child, the greatest gift you could ever give your mom is to go to church with them on Sunday morning. That's the greatest gift. And, uh, well, hi. You made muffins for your mom? Is that what you said? Breakfast, Breakfast for your mom. That's awesome. And so the littles are with us today. Um, because we wanted them to be able to sit with their moms during church and let them know how much they, they love you. And so uh, I hope a bunch of you made breakfast for your moms today. Hey, a um, couple of things to remind you of today. Um, we started for the month of May. May is our missions month, and May, the month that we, that we look at our Kingdom Builders ministries around here. We remind ourselves what we're doing and some of the great things we're accomplishing as a church family because we are a crazy, generous church that gives a ton to these different things, both by, by serving but also by giving to them. And so Street Life is a ministry down in Milwaukee that um, helps our most needy people, people who live on the streets, people who are involved in prostitution, people who are most needy, and it's a ministry to uh, love them so we have that privilege to share the gospel with them. And so there are some um, flyers out by the, by the, on the table, just outside to the left of the, of the doors here, um, by our Kingdom Builders wall, that say things that for the month of May we're collecting. We're going to collect those and then take those some boxes out there, put them in, and we're taking that all on the Street Life Ministry um, because they take, then take those things and they distribute them to people who uh, they are ministering to in the street. So that'll go through the end of the month. So start bringing that stuff in, and if we get a lot, we'll just send it down in shifts down to, down to Milwaukee, to, to Street Life. Also, another thing that you need to be aware of, um, we've been praying every Wednesday night um, for the last two months, um, saying, God, show us what the future looks like. Not that God's not a crystal ball. I should say this. Show us, God, what you're inviting us into as a church as individuals, as families, and it's been great prayer on, on Wednesday nights. Well, that prayer night will come to an end, the end of May, and then starting the first Wednesday of June, we have a seven-week Bible study for men and women led by Michelle Shulist. It's a study of Elijah, and it's a video-based study. Um, and so if you would like to be part of that Bible study on, the, on Wednesday nights, uh, we need you to sign up at the Connection Center just because we need to know how many books to buy. So sign up on that, and it's going to be a great study, and um, we're really looking forward to Michelle leading that. So they'll be starting the first Wednesday of June. And then remember something for this week, we have um, two, uh, 
I guess, wonderful and sad events. On Friday is uh, Dave Gary's memorial service here at the church at 1 o'clock. Um, no visitation in the beginning. Um, just go straight into the service at 1 o'clock and then a time of fellowship following. And then on Saturday, Tony Trier's memorial will be here at 10.30 in the morning. And as her family has requested, there will be no gathering time before or after. It'll be the service. And what we're going to do, just so you know, be aware of this now, um, because the family, because Tony did pass away of COVID, and the family is very concerned about COVID, um, the center section, we'll have this rope labeled, the center section is going to be reserved just for their family. Okay, so when you come on Saturday, the center section is going to be just for their family. They're very concerned about being socially distanced. And I'm going to ask you to do this, as I say this in a day today when there's maybe not a mask in the place. Can we honor Tony and her family when you come in and wear a mask? Um, it's a big deal to them. And so and there's not going to be a mask police, but will you do them? Will you, will you honor Tony in that way? And there's masks, bring a mask, wear a mask for it. Come in for the service. We're going to keep the center section um, free for them. And so they can center, they can, their family will sit just in there. And that you guys can go on both these sides and just, if you will, grab a mask when you walk in there, put one on. And, uh, um, Let's honor their family in that way. So that'll be Saturday at 1030. And again, no, no gathering before or after because of their, because of their preferences. Um, and then one more thing to re remind you about. On May 22nd, Saturday, May 22nd, hope you can all be here for four hours. We have every year a four-hour work day where we just get a whole bunch of stuff done in four hours. And many hands make light work. We do all kinds of little projects. And so if you can be here... Hope we have good weather because there's some outside projects going to be done if the weather cooperates. Otherwise, you've got a bunch of little things on the inside. And so if you can be here on the 22nd, that would be great. All right? I'm going to invite my better half up here this morning. She is my better half. Wouldn't you agree? If you agree, applaud. I know it's true. You know it's true. She doesn't know it's true. So let's do, a, let's do our best it's, to convince her of that over the years, right? Yeah. Right? So um, I asked Susie to join me today um, for the last of our pillars messages. We've been doing this series, and this is the, the fourth of the last of this little short mini-series that we're calling Pillars. And if you're visiting with us, what it is, is we're looking at people, both biblical characters and non-biblical characters, who the way we understand Christianity and the foundations that we, that we stand upon, the pillars that we stand upon, we can trace it back to these people. And uh, some directly and some, very, some indirectly, we can trace it back. Uh, matter of fact, the pillar we're going to look at today, and we'll talk about who it is in a minute, is a person who actually uh, ministered in an area where the Coptic Christian church was established. And the Coptic Christian church that was there for centuries was founded by Mark in the Bible, the Gospel of Mark writer, who we learned a pillar that we looked at uh, was influential in his life, and this pillar would not have been in his life. He probably would never have been in ministry the way he was. And who was that pillar we looked at? Barnabas. Barnabas. Because of Barnabas' ministry of John Mark, John Mark ends up um, planting, history says, the Coptic church in the country we'll talk about in a few minutes. And this person ended up dovetailing on that ministry 2,000 years later. So there's pillars that we stand upon. So we're going to look at the fourth of our pillar. The first pillar we looked at, we looked at an Old Testament character, and it was Jeremiah, and you guys humor me one more time. Jeremiah was not a bullfrog. That's right. He was, a, he, was a, he was not a bullfrog, not a friend of mine. He was an Old Testament prophet of God. So we looked at Jeremiah, Old Testament prop, character. Then we looked at an ancient church character. We looked at Augustine and saw how his theology and teaching, and primarily his writings, he wrote literally millions of words, his that were recorded, his um, teachings have shaped the Western church, that the way we understand church in so many areas, function and theology is because of the, the fourth century theologian, um, uh, Augustine. Then the third one we looked at was a, the New Testament character of Barnabas. We looked at how he's a son of encouragement and how his ministry affected um, so many others. And his ministry is a ministry of helping other people outshine him and how all of us can do the same thing. And the last one we're going to look at is a, is a uh, more recent history character. And it's a lady by the name of Lillian Trasher. 
And Lillian Trasher, anybody ever heard of the name Lillian Trasher? Some, okay. Lillian Trasher, the reason that we do, so in the Assemblies of God, um, and, and not just the Assemblies of God, the, for sure, U.S.-based churches in the last 100 plus years, one of the reasons or one of the, the ways that we do missions work and outreach work is through um, compassion ministries. And Lillian Trasher started an orphanage in Egypt, and we're going to tell you the story about it. It's an amazing story. Uh, an orphanage in Egypt in the early 1900s, like 1908-ish, I think she went, 1909, she went to Egypt to start an orphanage. She didn't know she was going to start an orphanage, but she went to start an orphanage. She went to, and, and her compassion ministries when, well, she was doing this and she got kicked out of the country one time to come to America. She, she came to America because she got kicked out because of the war. And she got hooked up with this little tiny group of people, a fledgling group of people, starting a new organization called the Assemblies of God. And so, which ends up becoming now, the Assemblies of God is seven, 75 million people worldwide. And not that we're here to, cel to celebrate that, but just she was part of it. She was doing what she was doing before the Assemblies of God started. And she recognized what God was doing in the, age, in the Assemblies of God. And they recognized what she was doing in Egypt and, and joined forces together. And so, so much of what we did, when we went to Cambodia as missionaries, the way Cambodia was opened up, we came on the shirt tails of people who got into Cambodia, how? By running orphanages. So the Tabers are here last weekend from Cambodia. Remember how they said they got into the country right, the war wasn't even over. How? They came in and run an orphanage. They took over a government orphanage. And so the reason we understand to do that one of the main reasons, because there's this lady that almost none of you ever heard of called Lillian Trasher, who started an or or, uh, orphanage in um, Egypt. And let me read a couple of things written about her in the secular press back in her day. In 1939, the Reader's Digest said this, Egypt is a land of wonders, but to me the greatest is Miss Lillian Trasher. So it was Reader's Digest magazine in America. And then upon her death, it says this in 1961, an article stated that she was the greatest American woman living outside the United States. So how do you know that? So in 1961, in her death, it was written in America that she was the greatest American woman living outside the United States. And so that's, that's pretty amazing for a lady that many of us have never heard of. And... Um, and so her, her, her ministry and life serves in so ways as a kind of pillar that we can, that we can, um, that we can learn from and emulate. And that's why we're doing this, this pillar series too, is not just to go, oh, that's really cool that Lillian was this way. Oh, really cool that Barnabas did that. Now I have more knowledge. No. Um, it's so that we can say, now I understand better. Jesus, how can I be more like that? Right? And so that's what we're going to look at Lillian today. And, and Lillian's story about how she got to Egypt as a young girl is amazing. And I wonder if, would you feel comfortable telling part of that story? So Sure, as long as you fill in any blanks that you fill in the gaps. You feel needed, because I'll be short. Here, here's the problem with filling in the gaps, and I take over. That's okay. 32 years of trying to figure that Our, one out. Every couple has the talker and the non-talker. The talker and the listener, I guess. And it's so. usually that the, they say, the woman's got all the words and the man doesn't. A gender, gender types don't always work. No, nope, Because not I our, got all the words and, and she's a listener. <laughs> not in your house either, right? <laughs> nope. Um, so Lillian, well, first of all, I want to say this. For kids who are like middle school and up, this is a great book to read. So parents, parents summer yep. reading list right here. This is an awesome book. Super easy read. Yep. I did what I never did. I sat down, I opened it up, and I didn't. I read the entire book. Yep, and I read it in a day. It's a really great, excellent, excellent book. But so Lillian Trasher was born to a family that it sounds like they had money, and um, it sounded like they, she didn't quite know why, but they ended up leaving, I think it was Georgia. New, New York, and then going to Georgia to Georgia. like a cottage. And um, so long story short, she's old enough to leave home, Growing up, she loved um, art. She could draw, sketch, things like that. So her dream was to become a sketch artist for the newspaper, The Georgian. The Georgian, yeah. um, in Atlanta. In Atlanta. Which was like the big deal in Atlanta so, in 1908. Yep, so she's ready to... You, is your, your mic's on, right? Okay. Can you hear him when he's adding? Okay, good. Um, Something that normally is not the problem, honey. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> so her dream is I'm getting. She tells her parents goodbye. I'm going. I'm going to go work for this newspaper. Seventeen she, years old. Seventeen years old, independent. She gets on the bus. She goes. Has the interview. No, on the, think of on the way down to the oh, interview. Oh yes, I missed. Okay. Amazing. That, this is it's the biggest a train. Part. Yes. Okay. See, this is why he should tell stories. <laughs> she was going He's the from storyteller. Whatever. Yes. She's going down the East Coast yes. to Georgia. So, however, she got there on a train. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, she sits down, and her, you know, the person sitting next to her, um, just starts conversation with her, and she's like, "Oh, you know, where are you going?" and and one thing leads to another. Well, this lady that sat next to her ran an orphanage in, do you remember, you ever remember what city? It was just, it was in North Carolina, just yeah. outside Charlotte. See, he's a detail guy. I'm the broad guy. So, um, starts talking about this orphanage. And um, she's like, I think you're supposed to come work with me at the orphanage because I need a helper. You could come and move in and you could take care of, I have 100 kids. You could take care of 100 kids with me. <laughs> Who wants to do that right now? Um, I mean, all of us mothers, we love kids, but a hundred of them, okay? So um, so Lillian, she's like sitting there and she's listening and she's like, wow, that's really neat, but I think I'm going to keep going. <laughs> like, I think I'm gonna, for me. I'm going to keep going where I'm going. And she's like, well, now you know, know the name of the orphanage. If you change your mind, you know where to find me. So, and the lady said, I don't believe in coincidences. Yes. You're sitting next to me for, on, on purpose. God put you next to me. And she's like, yeah, not. Yep. <laughs> but we all have to remember the steps of a righteous man are ordered of God. So yeah. in this case, it was very, very much true. Because she heads on, goes up to Atlanta, has her interview, and she meets with a guy. The guy looks at her sketches. He's like, this is really amazing. Come back tomorrow, and I'll let you know if you have a job. But based on what I'm seeing, I think you're going to get the job. So she does. She leaves. She comes back the next day. Well, the guy who interviewed her got sick, and there was somebody else there. So she talked to this other person, and the guy told her, he said, um, yeah, all I know is this guy hired somebody who he said was the best he's ever seen, so sorry, it's just not your day. So she was crushed. She left, she goes back to the, the house, house she was staying at, and she's just like sobbing her heart out. And it's her dream, you know, it's crushed. And she said all of a sudden, it was like this peace came over her when she thought about this orphanage. And she sat up and she's like, this is what God wants me to do. This door closed, I know I'm supposed to go. So when she had gone back to the newspaper place, the guy she talked with said, come back in like two or three days to get your sketches because she wanted them back. They couldn't find her sketches. And so they couldn't find them. And um, so she went back. Uh, three days later, she went back. After, you know, three days of planning, I'm going to this orphanage in North Carolina or wherever it was. And the guy walks in. He's like, where have you been? And she's like, I came back the next day, and the guy told me you gave the job to somebody else. He goes, you were the job. <laughs> the job was yours. But now you didn't come back for three days, so I had to hire somebody else. I couldn't wait. And she said, that's okay, because I know what I'm supposed to do, and this isn't it. So gets on a bus, and she goes to that orphanage, and she worked there for years. Five she years. ended up um, going to college while she was there. The um, Bible college. Yeah, I could just keep telling the story. So keep you guys tell me where to end. Well, keep to let's let's get her let's get her from there after five years at the orphanage helping. Yeah. So she feels a new calling in her life. Okay, so at, in this five years at the orphanage, you know she was you know in the book it talks about just you know she's exhausted. You're taking care of a hundred kids, feeding them. Like I can't even wrap my mind mind around it. Really. And it's a faith orphanage. They have no support. Yeah. So no when, support. They when would just she, pray. When Lillian met the lady on the bus for the orphanage. She said, yeah, I, we don't have any food for tomorrow for 100, for 100 kids. kids, but the Lord always provides it. So, I mean, it was that kind of faith that it took to be at this orphanage. So in five years, she is working with the orphans. She is dating. She's she engaged. finds a guy who is a pastor, and she is engaged to him. She gets all set. This is a week and a half before her wedding. And she goes to church. And there was a missionary there. 
And she said, the guy's talking about Africa, and tears were just streaming down my, eye, my face, and I knew I was supposed to go start an orphanage in Africa. Not an orphanage, just go as a missionary. Go, okay, go as a missionary. Whatever. So, Because <laughs> it's amazing how it happens. <laughs> no, Happy I Mother's know. Day. I know. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Details matter. <laughs> Details do matter. <laughs> um, so she... she Thank you. What are we doing? Do I need to get up? Thank <laughs> she, the leg is breaking <laughs> off the chair. <laughs> it's a, thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah, I saved my mom for, saving from me. embarrassing herself on a stage. <laughs> um, so she breaks the relationship off with her fiancé, and he told her, he said, I will wait for you. If you want to go for two or three years, I will wait. And she said, nope. I'm not holding on to anything here. And she said, I, I know I'm never coming back to America. Yep, so I, I'm never coming back. I'm not holding on to anything, which, wow, big lesson there. And um, she had to then get, she decided she wanted to hook up with the mission. You know, back then you had to have a missions organization to send you anywhere. So she knew of a conference in Philadelphia, I think, and she had to get the bus fare and lodging and all of that money raised. And so the Lord provided. It's amazing. I mean, she had no money. She, she just had no money. Stranger walk of hand or Yep. She, so she gets this $18. Well, then the orphanage, she had put this money somewhere. <laughs> and the person taking care of the money came and deposit, or spent the money on something. So she had no money to get to the conference. So then again, she's all discouraged because she's like, you know, I mean, we're talking 1910, right? Like $18 in 1910. I don't know. You could probably say what that equates to today, but I don't know. But it seems like it would be More a lot. And so she's just devastated, and, and the Lord provided the money for her. I'm telling you, this lady experienced people, like, knocking on her door and saying, are you going, to, are you going somewhere? Like, whatever. And Lillian needed, like, $100 and the people would just be crying and say, I'm just supposed to give you here this money and here's the $100. I mean, she experienced this over and over and over again to the point that, she, so she gets the money to get from the orphanage up to Philadelphia, I think. She gets to this um, guest house where she was going to stay and they said, oh, sorry, we don't have room for you. We, had these guys, we have a, a missionary from Africa who's staying here. Coincidence, right? So, she. Long story short, they made they rearranged some things. She stays there. But she meets. Did you tell meeting the missionary? That's that's this part. Yeah. Okay. At the guest house. So, she meets. So they're having dinner together, and it's a African husband and wife that are missionaries, and then one of their helpers. And they said, "Oh, so what are you doing?" And she said, "Well, I'm on my way to this conference because I want them to send me to Africa." And he, the guy who's, you know, this Christian missionary who obviously had to be well known to be back in the States at that time doing like this missions tour. This, a missions tour. And he told her, you're out of your mind. You need to go home. You, your dream is way too big. To this will never happen. Married. Go home <laughs> right now and get married and just stay here. And so, again, then she's devastated because somebody, she has this thing in her saying, you're supposed to do this, and somebody's saying, you're not, you're not doing it. So the guy came back to her the next day, day and said, you know, I am sorry. I should never have said that. And if you want to go to Africa, you can come with us. And we're going, excuse me, we're going to Cairo, right? It was okay, Egypt. Um, you can come with us. So if you can get the money to get from here over there, you can come. So she, again, I mean, we could spend like till five o'clock tonight talking about the miraculous ways God provided for it, but she did. She got the money and she got over there and then she stayed with them. And she stayed with them for I'll a short time. For, yes. I was we'll say, jump so, into our points. Yeah. So she stayed with them for three weeks. After three weeks, she has a sense of foreboding in her spirit. Something's going to happen. A man comes at night, knocks on the door and says, can't speak a word of English. She can't speak a word of, of um, whatever they're speaking. <laughs> um, and um, 
she goes with a person and says, they said, you can't go with me. So I, she goes, I have to. They go out there, go to a house on the side of the Nile River, and there's a dying 16-year-old mom with a baby, says, take my baby. And the, um, and the friend's with her, said, you can't take that baby. She says, take my baby. And there's an the old grandma there. So she says, has the translator say, tell old grandma to take the baby. And grandma said, no, I'll just take the baby. I'm sick and old. I'll throw, it. I'll throw the baby. He goes, I'll throw the baby in the Nile. It's only a girl anyway. He said, I'll throw it in the Nile. The way they did from the time of Moses. Just throw him in the Nile. Let him die. And she says, no. And she takes the baby, brings the baby back to the mission house. And after a couple of nights of the baby crying all night, this head of the mission organization comes and says, you can't stay here with that baby. It's keeping us awake all night. And we can't, we're, we're not able to do our work during the day. She walks out the door with the baby. She's been in there for three weeks. She walks out the door. She has virtually no money. She walks, she remembered she saw a for rent sign on a house. She walks up and says, I'm going to rent this house. Somehow God miraculously gives her the money. She rents the house and starts an orphanage. And she has nothing. She has no money. She's been in the country for three weeks, can't speak a word, and everybody believed she was going to starve to death or be murdered. Everybody around. So the poorest of the poor people started bringing her, bringing her food. The poorest, not the rich, the poorest of the poor because she was caring for the Egyptian baby. And then she found another baby, and another baby, and another baby, and another baby. And everybody started bringing their babies to her and she would supply. And so the, she had a donkey. They called her the donkey lady. She would ride around to the poorest people who would give her food she, to feed the babies. And then from there, she outgrew it and she had a vision for a, for a property across the, on the Nile and they said, you can't buy that. There's no way it's, it's a lot of money. She said, we're going to buy that piece of property. Sounds a little bit like OCS. We're going to buy that piece of property. And she gets it, and miraculously, the money comes in, and they buy the property. Then they say, well, you can never build a building. So she remembers, wait a minute. When the Egyptians, when the, when the Israelites were slaved in Egypt, Pharaoh made them make, make bricks. I got orphans. We can make bricks with the orphans. And so they figure out how to make bricks. They build a kiln. They start making bricks. And they build it, start building the first building and the next building and the next building. And people start seeing this. Eventually, tours what got so big, tours would come down the Nile. There, people would come off the, in their town, off the tour boats, to see the orphanage. And like princes would come in, diplomats, and go, this is amazing, and start giving her money. But what the story is, because we're getting some principles. We're not getting too many principles at all, are we? we the principles, we have four principles we're supposed to talk about that. We have, I'm, on, I'm on line one. Tell the story of how she got to Egypt. Um, <laughs> and so um, the amazing... Isn't this fascinating, though? The, ama you, mean, the amazing thing is, she, so they start doing, they start giving, just, uh, giving stuff, and all these amazing things happen. Like, they would get down to zero money, zero food, and she's like, I'm just spending the orphanage. I just can't do it anymore, God. I'm tired. I can't do it. I want to give up. And like one time, she, this orphanage is big. They had a thousand kids. I can't feed them. And all of a sudden, a person comes to her and says, uh, there's a war going on. She got kicked out of the country twice because of wars. And there was a whole ship of humanitarian aid going to one particular city. And the city was at war. And the government said, well, we can't send it there anymore. And this guy goes, wait a minute. I know this orphanage down here. And they bring a ship they're supposed to help a whole country. They bring it to her, and they're like, she's like, what do I do with an entire ship? You know, and they brought all the stuff in for, and she would live on it, and then she'd run out of everything, and she'd be destitute, and the kids would be all praying, and they, she'd train all the kids. They would all start praying, we have no food. A thousand kids praying, we have no food, we have no food. And all of a sudden, she'd get a check. Like one time, she got a check. They were completely at their wits' end. It was done. And they get a check. She go, a, male, a person walks up and gives her a mail, there's a check for $1,000, which back then was a ton, from a person in America who had addressed it to her in India. They had the wrong country. And the day they run out of money, it shows up and she goes, it's addressed to my name in the same name of the city in India. And she's going, the only explanation is a person, because they came through Kansas. The person in Kansas had to somehow know... This lady doesn't live in India. This lady lives in Egypt. Didn't change it. Didn't cross it out and write Egypt. Still forwarded it on. And the day that she was like ready to quit, they get $1,000 and the kids all start screaming because we can buy food for another day. That's how the whole orphanage ran the whole time. And so she did that for over 40 years. Eventually, she got so sick and wore out, um, she literally died 
there of exhaustion is basically how it happened. Um, but, and so the, the, the nation of Egypt like named the day after her. They honored her because no one had ever cared for any of the children in Egypt. They just threw them in the Nile. And this Christian lady did it. And so we told a lot of, we told the whole story now. There's still a lot more to read in the book. So we'll take, we'll take 15 more minutes and we'll tell some of the principles. Um, which one do we want to do? Uh, let's, talk, let's talk about this one, number two. That Lillian's ability to live by faith, because it was called the faith mission, was contingent on others with resources being generous. Because here's the deal. If you read the book, and I love the way the authors did it, it celebrates Lillian and you go, I could never be like Lillian. She's 17. She leaves. I mean, it, it, the story is amazing how she gets. So she's like, she has no money. And she just goes till her money runs out on the train to get to, 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 the other, to Egypt and just says, I'm going to stay in that city until God does something new. And she stays there, and then God makes something new, and she gets to the end of the next city, you know? And so we see it, we see, oh my goodness, she lived by faith, and she did live by faith. But here's what I was struck by. She lived by faith, but it only worked because other people who had resources listened to God and partnered with her. So everybody celebrates Lillian Trasher. But what I like about the book about her, this particular book, there's a number of them, is that she actually puts the names down of the people from being princes of nations to the poorest of poor and how it was without the poor people giving, the thing never would have got established. It was forever the poor. It wasn't anybody else. It was the poorest of the poor saying, we're poor. We know what it's like to be hungry. We will help. And so it took generosity. It took everybody. The faith mission only worked because everybody was involved. The poorest of the poor and riches of rich, and they all listened to God and did their part. And as we were talking about this, um, I told Mark, I said, uh, there's a verse that just kept coming to my mind as I was thinking about this story and us sharing today, and it's the verse out of Psalm 34, 18, and it says that God is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And I said, you know, we read that very often that it's just like God's doing. And God is big enough to, you know, he, he saves us, he gives us salvation. But there is a very real part of him saving the crushed in spirit from generous people. Mm -hmm. From the way he moves on our hearts to say, you know, um, you know, one of the situations in here was, you know, somebody who did not even know her. But somehow in her walk with the Lord, the Lord had compelled her to say, go to that place and give all that money to her. And she had to obey. She, you know, like we look at that like, wow, God, that's, you know, incredible that it worked out for her. Think of the faith that it took for the person to walk up to her and give her that money. And, and let me make a point about that. Mm -hmm. When that lady, because she's talking about a lady who gave her $60 to get the last 60 bucks to get over to Egypt on the streamer two months in a ship to get over. Um, Lillian didn't even want it. The lady knocked on the door. She didn't want to get up. She was, she was literally in bed sick with anxiety. She was so stressed out because she said, I'm buying a ticket on this, on the 8th of October, I'm leaving. She had, didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. And so people think this when you walk by faith. Oh, you walk by faith and, and God just makes it all work and you don't trust. You're the one walking by faith. Baloney. It's a spiritual word. Say baloney. baloney. It's baloney. You, she was so stressed. She was sick. And the lady came and knocked her door asking her questions about who are, what's your name? What do you do? Where are you going? And she said, I didn't want to even answer the lady. I gave her like, like terse answers, like just little quick answers like, get out of my house. I don't want to hear you. I'm sick. Don't you know God wants me to go to Egypt and I don't have the money and I'm sick? At the end, the lady, while she's talking, kneels down in front of her. And starts praying, and Lillian's like, this lady, stranger, is kneeling on the ground in front of me, praying, stands up, opens her purse and says, here, take this money. It's the exact amount of money she needed to go to Egypt, you know? And so the idea that you don't live by, that if you, if you live by faith, um, that there's no anxiety, oh my goodness. I remember when the first church we ever built totally lived by faith. I mean, we, neither one, we, we agreed to not work jobs, planted a church with no support, and after five years, we, the congregation grew, and we knew we were supposed to buy a piece of land. 
and we did not have the money. I signed a promissory note that in 30 days we would pay for the piece of land. We did not have one dollar. And everybody's like, oh, and then one, 30 days later, the money came from, no, I'm like, miraculous, the money came. And people go, oh, that was so nice, you live by faith. Ask her what it's like to live with the guy who's living by faith. <laughs> A nervous, stinking wreck who is vomiting in the toilet because so nervous, but going, oh my goodness, I'm pretty sure God said to do this. And it's always that, pretty sure. And so it's a two-way street. So, so when God tells you to do something by faith, don't ever use this idea. Well, I have a, this is what people always say. What's what do people sell you all the time, honey? If you say, should I do this? I do, what, they, what do they say they want? You know what? I just trust you to say it. No, I'm not going to. There's too many things going on. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'll do that if I have a peace about it. Oh, yes. Uh, a lot of, th- she didn't have any peace. She just was convinced God told her to do it. Now, there were seasons of peace, and every time God provided, she felt peace. But she's in her bed sick. And then God provides, you know. And so it took the person to have that faith dream that God gave them. And it took the people who obeyed, that walked up and said, I don't know who you are, but God told me to come here. Or the prince who says, I go to my country, I saw what you're doing, and I'm sending money from my government to you, you know. You know, so that that stuff, it took both. It took all the people. It's action and obedience on both parts. Yeah. On the the one going and the one sending, you know. Yeah. So 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 what's what's the summation for all of us? Number one, God asks you to do something. Don't use a thing. Oh, I don't feel peace about it. Um, You sit with it and you find out, is God really saying it? Because sometimes when God says it, you still don't feel peace. You'll feel convinced, but it's not necessarily peaceful. Um, and number two, it's not just the person being asked to go do some, something that we all look and go, man, they're nuts going to Cambodia. They're nuts going to Egypt. It takes all the other people to say, I, I, I'm going to take the great, great risk of generosity, the great risk of generosity, and I'm going to partner with what is God is, I see God doing in this person. Yeah. And if you're reading the Love Does book, the, from the, the, that's our missions book. For the month. I mean, what a great encouragement, you know, like... He puts his money where his mouth is, and it's really challenging, you know, reading it, saying, wow. Like, the things he, he did. The things he, he does and the way, nope, God, God said it, I'm doing it. Like, no, no questions asked. It's, it's not as easy, yep. you know, to do, even though we trust the Lord. There's let's, a challenge. In let's there. talk one about one, more, one of our other principles. Yeah. This one. Transmitting faith in Christ and Christ-like character to others is our greatest goal. I'm going to read an excerpt from the book, from page 182. I'm going to read a section out of there that says this. A reporter interviewing, is interviewing her and asks this question. Tell me what is the greatest thing, um, greater than any other, that you are doing in Egypt, he asked. And Lillian's answers. Lillian thought for a moment... It was not the kind of question she was normally asked. Her thoughts went back to the crowded house in Cairo, and she replied, For these 40 years, I've been trying to live in such a way as to pass something tangible to a new generation. I would like to pass on a disposition of Christian character, to live before these orphans every day the way I want them to live in their homes in the land of Egypt. I try to show them how to smile, even in the shadows. Every hour... Of the day and night, I do my best to live before them the life I want them to live before their fellow man. She spread her hands out to emphasize what she was saying. I try to transmit to them a life, to know that if they can trust God, everything will be all right. I do my best to teach them to have faith in God so that they'll be able to face life with a heart of trust. I try to pass on to them a power, a power of prayer, a power with fellow men that they may teach others how to find a true way. And I love the way she says that. I would love to pass on to them a disposition of Christian character. And so she understood what Paul was saying. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow the Lord, that she was saying, my actions speak louder than my words, that as Christians, we want to live in such a way that we want others to follow our example. And that's what she said she was doing in Egypt. Right. And the thing, one of the things I just love about her story is she became a a person of 
notoriety, you know, somebody that would be considered successful. You know, they wanted her to come back to the States and travel. And, you know, one of the other lines from her book, it just, uh, so in Egypt they had declared a, a lily and trash her day, you know, a holiday named after her. And, you know, she said as, as exciting as that is and, you know, how much it makes her feel good, she never lost sight of the goal. And the goal was to give the poorest children the opportunity to grow and flourish in the Christian family environment. And as you read the story, these kids, I mean, they sought God. They learned how to pray from watching her pray. They learned how to fast from watching her fast. They learned how to trust God and have faith by them watching her. And, you know, at the end, you, really, you guys really want to read this book, just so you know. Um, it just tells stories of how these kids that came through became pastors and and had and fam- lawyers, got, lawyers and, and doctors, they, but they had they got married and they had families and those families raised cr- kids for Christ, you know, and and that is no different than than what we want to do today, right? We want to raise you know little Callies and Levi's and Archies and Eloise and and Lily and Ricky's and all the other kids, you know, for Jesus. And, but she gave up everything. She gave up everything to do it. But she would say she gave up nothing. Yes, to her she, she gave up nothing. She would say she gained everything. Yep. She gained everything yeah. to do it. And look at it. She said she gave up being a mom, and she had always had over 1,000 children. She's like, I didn't give up being a mom when they asked her that. They're like, she, she gave up being married. Right. She's like, no, I, gave, I didn't give up being a mom. I'm a mom to 1,000 kids. She goes, you're only a mom to one or two. <laughs> She's like, they call her mama, yep. you know? Yep. Uh, and, and Lillian herself, it, it didn't say if she was raised in a Christian home, but it, it made a statement that she did not feel comfortable talking to her parents about Christian things, about anything religious. But her neighbors... Yeah, she got saved through her neighbors. Right, her neighbors had a prayer time or a Bible study, and she'd walk through the woods and go to that, and... She, one day on the way home, halfway between, there was a log, and she stopped, and she gave her life to the Lord at that log. And then years later, when all of this was happening, it was, she went back to that very spot, and that's when she committed her life to missions, you know, to follow the Lord wherever. Um, and so, Christian, you know, the relationship with Jesus was transmitted to her from a neighbor, and then she transmitted it. So, you know, what you're doing today with your kids... Grandkids. And grandkids is transmitting faith, but the same thing you're doing with your neighbor kids or the kids in kids' church or the kids at a school, you know, you're transmitting faith and you're transmitting hope and life to our kids. And I mean, I just think the day, I mean, it's always important, but boy, the day and age we live in with every value being questioned, how important is this? Amen. So great things to learn from Lily. We got a bunch more, but we're going to stop there because we're kind of out of time. I'd recommend this if you want. Um, go on YouTube and just type in Lillian Trasher. The Assemblies of God made a documentary about her, but like in the 50s, it was really cool. It shows you how far we've come. It's a black and white in the 50s, and it's really kind of fun to watch. And uh, they show Lily, and they interview her. They have a couple of clips of her talking, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's uh, I think it's called The Mother of the Nile. So just type in Lillian Trasher, and there's like a 45-minute a or a 30-minute little video you can watch that was created about her, a little documentary about her, and it's, and it's phenomenal on seeing just what God accomplished through one lady who was willing to say, I'll, go, I'll allow you to redirect me. I was going to go this way. I'll allow you to redirect me. I'll allow you to, to move me. I'll step, I'll walk in faith. I'll, I'll allow other people to partner with me, and um, we'll accomplish something great for God. And so it's what, what one person can do. So what one mom can do, because she was the mom to thousands that were not biologically hers, but were absolutely she was their mother. So what, that's why we picked Lillian Trasher on Mother's Day to be our pillar. I mean, let's, let's stand together. We'll close our service in, in a word of prayer. Uh, ladies, when you leave, moms, when you leave today, our kids will be greeting you at the back door. Some of our kids giving you a gift, saying that they love you. So they're heading out there to get ready for that. And uh, hey, on this Mother's Day, if you haven't called your mom today and maybe there's tension and you're estranged, this would be a great day for you to reach out. 
Might not fix everything, but you know what? Your heart will do well and your mom's heart will do well if you reach out today. So let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much that um, you give us examples. You tell us there's a cloud of witnesses around us. And Lord, that we have the example from all of these characters. We look at these characters from the Old Testament and ancient church history and the New Testament and now more recent church history. People that, Lord, we can learn from, be challenged by. And Lord, we would ask today as we think of what it means to be a person who hears your voice and follows your call, even when we're nervous about it and anxious about it, that, Lord, you... You don't let us crash and burn. And Lord, you care for us and you lead us and you accomplish really wonderful things through each and every one of us as we surrender. And Lord, on this Mother's Day in particular, we pray that as you're speaking into the hearts of every woman in our church family, that Lord, you would show them how they in particular have been, are being, and can be used to be an influence for you in the world that we live in. And Lord, we pray that at Portview Church, our ladies would know how valuable they are. And that, Lord, they would find the place to use their gifts and their talents for you. And together, Lord, we'd see this world change for eternity. So, Lord, now bless every single one. Give us all a great day as we, as we um, celebrate you and have a special emphasis on moms. Lord, let your, rest, re- let your goodness rest on every one. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you, friends. Have a wonderful Mother's Day. Be blessed. Amen.